time tonight. And um, so while, while he comes up and gets situated, I, Monty had shared after did our fall retreat. Was it two, three years ago? Three years ago, maybe? Four, four years? Wow. Is this what it's like to be older? <laughs> wow, four years ago. I felt like it was yesterday. Um, but Monty shared about his, his uh, relationship with Kimberly. And the things that Monty shared four years ago are things that I still carry with me now and am trying to apply. And so please, please lend your ears to him. Monty just has so much wisdom to share to you. And the things that he's talking about tonight are the things that have revolutionized my life and changed who I am and who, um, and hopefully will change who you are too. So there's just so much truth um, coming from, from him tonight. Um, so please lend your ears to him um, and give him a, a warm welcome as he shares his last message with us. Good, good, good. Well, it has been a blast being with you guys this weekend. I do appreciate your hearts to engage, and uh, I do remember being a student and coming to things like this, and, and God really did some significant stuff in me. I, I had some things happen during college that really marked me and, and kind of set the course. My decision to join the staff of Camp Crusade happen at a summer project and that's not the purpose but what God did in me was that summer I I basically just realized that I couldn't spend the rest of my life not being about the mission wherever I was whether that was with crew or selling shoes didn't matter I was going to be about the mission so anyway all right well we're going to dive in and finish up uh, our look at freedom and I, I want you to, to think back to that video that we had, the, the prison motif, right? And the question, what is your prison? And I hope, again, that that's been in there somewhere. We've been thinking about that. Not, not in terms of like feeling guilt and condemnation, but just going, you know what? I feel enslaved by this thing. And then this other side, this, again, this beautiful picture of wide open spaces. And I hope that what's happened as we've been talking this weekend is that you have gone from a place, perhaps, of despair, discouragement, um, maybe just apathy, complacency, that, some of that kind of stuff, to a place of hope. That's the point. If you and I really get freedom for what it really is, we're hopeful. We really begin to believe that life can be all that God says it can be. Right? <laughs> All right. Okay, so so here we go. Uh, what's our verse? 5-1? Does anybody want to just step out and be bold? <coughs> Is it on the screen behind me? Yeah. It was. It is for freedom to press it as free. Yeah. Okay, good. I thought that was. Like, I, was I, I couldn't quite. There you go. Awesome. It's all right. Keep working on it. Uh, that's a good one to know. And we said that the foundation for freedom is the gospel, right? And then the fortification for freedom is our faith. Our faith is what what really protects. Our relationship with God from kind of outside assault. Just the pressures and stresses and temptations and all that of the world. Now we're going to go inside. We're going to talk about what's happening in here as it relates to freedom. But the question that, that I think of when I think about the gospel and I think about faith and all that is, well, what is this freedom for? Why did you give it to me in the first place? What is the point? Of having it, other than just the the fun of being free. Uh, remember the definition: the ability and desire to live as God intends. So, what we're trying to do is kind of fill in what that means. What is it that God intends? Well, some real basic answers. This is like how we start, and it can get a whole lot more complex. But greatest commandments: love God, love your neighbor. Right? Okay, so. Being made free has to be about being free to love God and love my neighbor. Does that make sense? Right, okay. Then there's also the Great Commission, Matthew 
28. Go to all the world and make disciples. Help other people understand how they can freely walk with Christ. So why is it that Christ would set me free? So that I could love God, love my neighbor, and be about the mission. Okay? So there's purpose in our freedom. It's not just about having an experience. It's about being involved in something much bigger than myself. Galatians 5, 13 and 14. We, we did hit this earlier, but I do want to read it again. And pardon me, it was just a tad dark up here. Uh, 513. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Remember, we'll talk about that's the license side of the temptation uh, apart from freedom. But here's, here's the key. But through love, serve one another. Through love, serve one another. So the aim <coughs> of freedom is love. I can know that I'm really living free the way God intended when it is bringing me to a place of loving well. So that's, that's where we're going to go this evening. We're going to talk about how do we do that and what does it look like in very practical terms on my insides where nobody else can see. Because I can put on a smile, I can do a song and dance, and I can fool everybody in the world, but I can't fool myself and I can't fool God. So let's talk about what happens on the inside. Loving people is a lot easier to talk about and a lot harder to do, right? Why, why is it hard to love people? Just throw some thoughts out here. They're crazy. They're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're starting. There we go. People are crazy. People hurt you. Yeah, okay. Annoying. Annoying, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I was going to say, everything that we're sharing, you know, probably is true of us too. So, you know, we're just kind of all in the same club here. And there's a lot of uncertainty, isn't there? Wouldn't it be nice if we could just love people that just did exactly what we wanted them to do, that were just like us, that, you see what I'm saying? That, that it just isn't that way, right? We're all, we're all different. So Paul knew that we were going to ask that question, and he starts in verse 16 to answer the question, how are we going to love and serve? The answer is walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Now, how many of you have heard that phrase before? <coughs> okay, lots of you. Not, that's not surprising at all. My experience was that uh, Christians throw that phrase around a lot, but we sometimes don't ever get around to talking about what that really means in everyday life. So I, you just kind of go, Kevin, a walk in the Spirit, and I hope that I'm doing it right, because I might not be. And, you know, how will I know? And so we're going to answer those questions about what it means to walk by the Spirit. There's a promise attached to it. It says if you walk by the Spirit, you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Right? Remember we talked about the flesh is opposite of the spirit. That's where we're going. Right now, here is the principle that I want you to take away in terms of walking in the spirit. You will never walk in the spirit without fighting. You know when Paul tells Timothy, I want you to fight the good fight of faith. This is it right here. This is the good fight of faith. It's not out there. Our battle isn't against flesh and blood. But it's against principalities, and powers, darkness. It's stuff that we can't see sometimes, but we know is real. Because we can look at our life and see the effect. And God never expects us to, uh, to fight this fight alone. So we're not in the battle alone. So let's talk about the fight of faith. And this is the fight inside the walls. Our faith is important. We're building a fortification and that certainly helps with the outside. Now we're going to go inside. Galatians uh, 5.17. Next verse. The desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Okay, a couple thoughts. Flesh. 
what is the flesh? I mean, when you become a Christian, doesn't, doesn't all the bad stuff kind of go away, and now you're just this holy, righteous saint that does everything right? Has anybody had that experience? Yeah. No, there, there is, I like to think, of, there's this residue of sin that is still in me. It didn't go away. It's always there. It doesn't mean that I'm a bad person. It doesn't mean that I didn't really come to Christ. It means that that's part of living in a broken world. Okay? So, so we got the flesh, but we also have the spirit. Ephesians 1.13 talks about at the moment of conversion, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, I mean, let this blow you away, takes up residence in you. You know, in the Old Testament, they had the temple, and that was the place where God dwelt. Well, we're told in the New Testament, we're the temples of God. He dwells in you. So you are a vessel, and in you, you have flesh. The residue of sin still there, rendered powerless, but still present. And then you have the Spirit of God. And they are always opposed to each other. Now, the thing that always confused me about this passage was it says to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And so I was like, well, what things? Like, which things that I want to do? And the answer is yes. All the things that you want to do. All the things that you want to do that are opposed to God, that are sinful, that are deceptive, that are wrong, all of those things, the Spirit is in you and opposed to the flesh so that you won't do those things. The flesh is opposed to everything that you will ever want to do that is righteous and holy and good and obedient and faithful because the flesh doesn't want you to do those things. You guys see what's going on here? So that battle is constantly going on in you. And it will never stop for the rest of your life. Now, you, you don't have to be discouraged because we've been set free from the law of sin and death. That means that the flesh has been rendered powerless. It can't make us do anything. The only power that our sinful flesh ever had is the power that we get. Okay? So, you've got this battle constantly going on inside of you. And, uh, and you've got some choices to make. I've got some choices to make. And we are free to make those choices. That's the beauty of what we're talking about. Here's the fight of faith. I'm going to put flesh and spirit up on the screen. And we're going to look beneath, of the, beneath each of those. On the flesh side, you have self-centeredness. That's what the flesh thinks about. Itself. Pleasing itself. Getting its way. Doing what it wants. Okay? That's the flesh side. On the other side, we have self-sacrifice. Uh, Philippians 4. Uh, consider one another as more important than yourself. Right? Um, self-interest is opposed to the influence of the Spirit in our lives. So when we talk about walking in the Spirit, it's going to look like us thinking of others as more important than ourselves, very practically. I mean, that's something that you can, you can kind of quantify or measure. You guys know what I'm saying? That it's not this ambiguous kind of thing. I can kind of know. I'm not thinking about just me or somebody else. Now, quick side comment. That doesn't mean that you never think about yourself, that you don't take care of yourself. Okay? That's not what that means. It just means that you are mindful of the people around you and how God might want to use you for the good of others. And that's what we naturally don't think about. Our flesh will not naturally think about that. The flesh is fueled by discontentment. It's always aware of what it doesn't have. And rarely aware, if ever, so the flesh is always asking for more. The spirit, on the other hand, is characterized or fueled by gratitude. Do a study sometime. Just, you know, the Psalms would be great, but you could go a lot of different places. And just, just take note of how often you see the word thanks, thanksgiving, 
be grateful, that kind of stuff. You'll be amazed at how often we're told to, uh, to be thankful and to remember the things that we have received from the Lord. So we've got self-centeredness for, with flesh, self-sacrifice with the Spirit, discontentment with the flesh, gratitude with the Spirit. Here's an image for you to think of the flesh. Um, think of the nastiest, sleaziest, most deceptive salesman you can possibly imagine. And that is your flesh. He's slick. She's slick. She can, she can talk a mile a minute, and it sounds good. It, it makes you pause and think, that might be a great deal. But the flesh will jack you around every time. Never delivers. Always deceives. That's the flesh. That's what's going on inside of you and inside of me. So, you and I have to make a choice. If we're going to walk in the Spirit, we're going to have to do something very, very intentional. Here's the image. I was a gymnast in college, so you guys know what still rings are, right? The big straps and the rings, and guys get up to the cross kind of deal. Okay, we're going to work with that. But instead of the rings going straight up, they're going to be tied out to the, to the right. So maybe we can even throw in a little, uh, you know, American Ninja or something. So we got two straps going out here. we got rings, and both hands are connected to those rings, all right? One of those rings is the spirit, and one of those rings is the flesh. Okay? And you can't hold on to both. Now what happens if I let go of the spirit? I can't help it. I'm going to swing this way 10 out of 10 times, right? But gravity just pulls me there. So what happens if I let go of the spirit? I swing this way every time. That's just the way it works. So when you and I are facing a decision, big or small, Here's where we are. You gotta let go of one and hold on to the other. It's really, I say it's as simple as that. It's a hard choice. But once you make the choice, you swing in the direction that uh, they each other. Does that make sense? So walking in the spirit is really clinging to the spirit, depending upon the spirit. Uh, I'm gonna talk very specifically about uh, some words that we can kind of use to think about that carefully. But uh, big and small decisions. And uh, another interesting thing is whichever way we decide to go, we, that tend to become a pattern. So sin begets sin a lot of times. Because a lot of times I make that choice and then I feel bad about it and I think, well, crap, what the heck? And then I go there again and then what's the use? What's the point? Who cares? God, but they didn't love me anymore. You can see how that just, it's like a snowball. just keeps going. But the same thing works with the Spirit. Man, the more uh, obedient I am to Him, the more responsive I am to His initiatives. Um, Jesus said there was going to be a helper that would come when He left. He said, That's, that helper will guide me into all truth. The key thing that, that sin does is deceive. So the great advantage of having the Spirit is He tells us what's true. He tells us the truth. So, I want to ask you to put another uh, passage in your mind. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. I, you know, I find myself going to this passage over and over and over and over again. It, it's, it doesn't matter what I'm talking about. Somehow I kind of come back to this. Because it's so instructive about real life. Not just uh, kind of imaginary stuff, but, but the real deal. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your path. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. That is the spirit of life right there. 
It's choosing. Are you going to trust in yourself? Or are you going to trust in the Lord? Yeah, I mean, all the stuff we've been talking about, starting last night today. Trust in the Lord, not in yourself. Acknowledge Him in everything. Recognize. He's God. I'm He loves me. He loves me more than I love myself. Acknowledge Him in every way. And He'll make straight your path. He will actually go ahead of you and say, this is the way. Walk in it. It's not guesswork. And even when you come to those places where you can go that way or you can go that way, it's okay. You can go either way. The Lord's in it. He's, he's with you and for you. And He can use either way. If, if, they're, if neither of them is sinful, right? There's lots of freedom there. Be not wise in your own eyes. Man, humility. It's just priceless. Turn away from evil. Let go of the proposals of the flesh. Let them go and swing to the Spirit. And it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. You will be free. Not just as a position, but as an experience. You will walk in freedom. You will walk in the freedom to love God, to love your neighbor, and to be an opposition. Those things that are most important to God, according to God. Here's three words that I want to give you to, that relate to that. The first is to be faithful. To be faithful. Once again, it's one of those Christianese words that sometimes we don't really talk about. I just think of it literally as being full of faith. Hebrews says faith is what? Okay. Right. It's this, it's this idea that I know things. I don't have to see them to know them. If God said it's true, I believe it, and I'm going to act upon that. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Okay? And then just a few verses later in verse 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we want to be full of faith, trusting in Him. Secondly, attentive. Attentive. I've talked about uh, the Spirit being our guide. Attentiveness means that we're eager to hear. And, uh, you know, I'll just tell you, I've never heard the audible voice of God. Okay? It could happen. It might happen. I don't know. But I hear the voice of God every single day in this book. Loud and clear. Doesn't mean sometimes it's not hard to understand. Doesn't mean sometimes I don't have to get help. But this is as good a voice as you will ever hear in your lifetime. We're, we're, we're told that, man, we have great advantages having a, the recorded scriptures at our disposal, which most Christians for most of history did not. What a blessing. Here's a way to think about being attentive. Um, I call it well, I'll start with uh, how many Siri users do we have here? Man, not many. I'm kind of shocked. Right? So you got Hey Siri, right? Is that right? Oh, Siri. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, not like your cousin or your aunt. Hey Siri. And then we got OK Google. I know Jess is a big OK Google guy. There we go, right? And then if you drive cars, you can do OnStar, right? I think I've got OnStar logo. But here's the deal. <laughs> that is awesome, man. Okay, so the concept of all of those is that somebody is always with you, watching out for you. That's the Spirit. The Spirit is never out of touch, never not paying attention, never distracted, always attentive to you. Always guiding you into all truth, if you'll just listen. So, that's, that's the Spirit's presence. Now, illumination in the juncture. Here it is, real simple. Um, I have very little confidence in my own ability to always hear right from God. So, I, I check myself constantly. Okay? I've been to seminary. I've 
read my Bible for a long, 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 long time, all that, I still don't trust myself. Okay? But here's what I do trust. If I find agreement in what I understand from the Word, the prompting that I have from the Spirit, and the opinions and ideas of the community of faith, when all three of those come together, I have a very high degree of confidence that I'm leaning on truth. Does that make sense? So in other words, I don't ever just read my Bible and make an interpretation and go, got it! For sure. Inerrant. I just don't do that. I think that's very unwise. What I do is I prayerfully consider what's there. I read what other people have written about that passage. I go to some of my closest friends and I say, hey, what do you think about this? What have you read about this? And I'm looking for unity around an understanding. Where I get that, I have a lot of confidence that I have heard right. Okay? So a great practice in terms of being attentive. And then lastly, obedience. And you know, obedience, we're talking about freedom, right? So unfortunately, obedience has been made to be legalistic. And then, well, you better obey or God's going to get mad. Right? I mean, it, when you say it, it sort of sounds stupid, but that's how we react a lot. But what if it's my obedience is really more about my good? My father loves me. He's always going to lead me in, in good places, right? Places that are good for me. So to obey is just to go, yeah, God, I think you're for me. So I'm just going to fall in line with that. So faithful, attentive, and obedient. With all that in mind, let's think back to our definition of freedom. The ability and the desire to live as God intends. We cannot do that without walking in the Spirit. But we've been made free so that we can walk in the Spirit. I want to end with a little bit of motivation for you. Still in Galatians 5, down a little bit further, verses 22 and 23. You know, Paul's a smart guy, and he was inspired by the Spirit, so this all just kind of makes sense, doesn't it? He says, the fruit of the Spirit. You're swinging to the Spirit, faithfulness, attentiveness, and obedience. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Gentleness and self control. I'm just faithless. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> now, think back to this morning. Remember Neil? Remember all? Remember how great his life is since he threw away religion? It's amazing how much this list looks like what he says he's getting apart from God. And you and I know that it ain't going to last. Life just isn't that way. But God says, if, if you'll walk with me, if you'll live in the freedom that I've given you, this is what you do. The fruit of the Spirit. Do? Jesus. Jesus. I think he was a child, but we never know. Now, okay, so think about the Lord. From a motivation standpoint, remember the two questions that I asked you when we watched the video. What kind of life do you have? And what kind of life do you want? Do you want a life full of love, joy, peace, patience? Is that if that's the kind of life you want, that's the kind of life you're going to have. It's not reserved for just a few spiritual elites. It is for anybody who will receive it. Just as you received Christ that first day, that first moment of conversion where you said, I need you to forgive me and restore me and adopt me and make me new, just like that day are the rest of your days. And the Lord promises to give you free if you'll live that way. Secondly, Galatians 6, 7 through 9. 
not going to get into all the details. I encourage you to read it. But it's basically the principle of sowing and reaping. And once again, we tend to think about on the negative side of, well, if you sow crap, that's what you're going to get. So don't do it. Right? But <laughs> it's the other. It's If you'll sow to the Spirit, you get the Spirit. Does that make sense? Like we don't... We don't have to worry about doing the other if we're really focused on doing the good stuff. And the promise is, if you'll do that, you're going to reap a reward. Guaranteed, God never, ever misses that. He remembers it all the time. So through the Spirit and great reward, those are promised to those who will live out of freedom that they have been given in Christ. Well, I uh, I want to encourage you. I'm gonna, I guess I want to kind of challenge you for the next uh, maybe the next 30 days or so. I've heard it takes 30 days to, to make it happen. But um, maybe to have a get a journal or something and uh, just just take a few moments every day. Think about those two questions. What kind of life do I have? What kind of life do I want? And just write something, anything that comes to your mind about freedom related to this weekend. Just, you can bounce all over the place. Maybe go back to some of those passages. But just see if the Lord doesn't really give you a vision. Because remember what I said at the very beginning, what I wanted for my kids and what I want for you is I want you to have a vision for living free. Not just for this weekend. Not just for this year. But for the rest of your life. And I'm telling you, the stuff we've been talking about this weekend, you can apply it for the rest of your life. So what an opportunity to, to begin to live that out now. You won't get it right all the time. I don't mean it. But um, you can't live free. All right. Let me pray for us. Father, uh, as I stand here and talk about freedom, you know and I know that there are uh, so many times when I sell for the weak and elemental things of this world. But when I do talk about freedom, and when I look in your word, I see that there's nothing better than this life and this broken world freedom you have secured for us in Christ. So I pray for these friends, these young friends that, uh, that this season in their life that they would uh, choose to receive the great freedom that you offer them in Christ. And uh, I pray that it would change them and mature them and uh, cause their lives to bear much fruit. Until you return.